Hi, all of you awesome scuba divers out there. Welcome to the Scuba Diver Magazine podcast, where I break down the latest scuba diving news and things that have piqued my interest over the previous week. This week, the first ever woman cave diver is being recognized into the Women Divers Hall of Fame. A study has shown that MPAs are actually making a huge difference in the waters where they're actually enforced. And there's a new underwater museum being created with loads of underwater artifacts for us to check out. So yeah, the first news story is pretty interesting. This this is um, a, a news article on DiverNet, and it's uh, covering a British diving pioneer, Penelope Powell, uh, who's nicknamed Mossy, who was a woman born in the Edwardian era, and she's going to be one of seven divers to be inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame uh, in its class of 2024. Powell, who died in 1965 at the age of 60, uh, is being recognised posthumously as the first women cave diver and co-author of the first cave diving book, The Log of the Wookiee Hole Exploration Expedition. At the age of 31, she was designated diver number two for the first successful cave dive using breathing equipment in Britain. It took place at Wookiee Hole. Uh, the cave system in uh, in Somerset's uh, Mendip Hills on the 18th of August 1935 and British cave divers uh, will know Wookiee Hole very um, very well uh, it's a very popular cave system so of course everyone wanted to be uh, like um, there was the expedition leader who was Graham Balcom uh, he was always going to be diver number one so of course everyone else wanted to be diver number two to get their names in the history book and uh, and it was actually given to Penelope and it was quite an arduous um, uh, attempt for her mainly because it wasn't like cave diving that we know today uh, she was in the, the like the vintage like canvas suit with the, the helmet and everything and the suit itself um, was was pretty poor for her because it, it wasn't designed for her. Um, it was designed for a, a male fit, so it didn't fit around her wrists um, particularly well. Uh, so on this three-hour dive uh, over a distance of 52 meters, uh, yeah, she had to uh, sort of just get on with it with this suit that didn't quite fit her and as the dive leader uh, Graham Balcom explained to uh, to BBC Radio uh, quote she has to safeguard me against any accidents or sudden drops as I go forwards uh, I'm at the end of our line and I'm proceeding only with the safeguard of number two diver um, and later on uh, Pal dismissed her role in the record-breaking dive as quote unimportant um, so just an awesome character and it is nice to see her um, in Inducted into the Women's Divers Hall of Fame. A new study of 51 marine protected areas or MPAs in more than 30 countries across North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia and Oceania has concluded that in every case their existence boosted either fishing or tourism with profits sometimes in the billions of dollars. Quoting... In every corner of the globe, ocean protection boosts economies. Uh, that was said by the study author Dr. Mark John Costello, a professor at Norway's Nord University, quoting, For far too long, marine parks have been overlooked as GDP generators and job creators. This study offers the strongest evidence yet that protecting the ocean replenishes it with abundant fish, protects it against climate change, but also l boosts local and national economies. Now we can add Add tourism operators and fisheries to the list of ocean protection beneficiaries, proving that not only tourism uh, but fisheries actually benefit from imposing strict environmental protection measures in key areas is regarded as crucial in securing the active support of fishing and other communities. Uh, so the peer-reviewed studied was described as the most comprehensive assessment of its kind by National Geographic Society Pristine Seas as it welcomes its findings. It's nice to know that these kind of um, uh, new restrictions and uh, and like requirements are, are actually doing something. It is not just something that's written down on a piece of paper. Uh, you, we're actually seeing positive outcomes, uh, measurable outcomes that are coming from them. 
it said that the paper built on previous research showing that fully protected areas could help to restore fish populations by an average of 500% uh, yield bigger fish over time and replenish fisheries surrounding the MPAs, which is kind of the whole point of them. And it just makes sense because if there are no safe areas, then you're just going to overfish the area and they're all going to disappear. However, if you have these dedicated zones, which the fish granted the fish don't know they're there but they know whenever they're in this area they don't get caught uh, so it gives them the safe area to to breed to grow and uh, and just replenish their numbers and then any fish that branch out of those mpas those are the ones that quit that get caught uh, so it, it's yeah it just makes sense and this study goes on to show that, yeah, it, it does actually have a, a measurable impact. Costello reviewed 200 previous studies covering 51 MPAs in diverse ecosystems from coral reefs to kelp forests, mangroves, rocky reefs, and salt marshes and mud flats. Um, and from some that just limited human activities uh, to other MPAs that just banned them altogether, a, a wide range. And that's why they're saying this is one of the biggest studies because they've just had a look at every single um, slight possible combination. And the economic benefits to fisheries were reported for 25 countries uh, from yeah, the, the North Atlantic, the Pacific, uh, to uh, Indian Oceans. And the fisheries adjacent to MPAs were detected in 46 MPAs, uh, including both increased catches, about 76% of them, uh, and fish body size by 25%, and the spillover was detected in 16% of cases. MPAs delivering the greatest economic benefits were the no-take marine reserves, but less than 3% of the ocean is currently under such strict protection, uh, but that this study may uh, just be useful evidence to, um, uh, to push them forwards and make more of them, these no-take marine reserves. The fishing industry uh, has obviously historically uh, sought to block no-take MPAs because they think it's in their or not in their best interest, um, arguing that banning the fishery, uh, the fishing delivers a uh, blow to their profits. Uh, but actually what this study unequivocally shows is that MPAs that ban fishing are not only more profitable for them in that area, they're also cheaper to manage and maintain than MPAs with more complex fishing rules. Uh, if it's just, you know what, no take, um, just nothing whatsoever, it's a lot easier than Oh, well, yeah, actually, we've got to inspect this, and if it's of a certain size, and mm, technically, and all this kind of stuff, uh, no, it, where it's just no take, it just makes it far, far easier. So it's nice to see that someone's spent the time to uh, to look at all of the uh, the marine protected areas and um, and crunched all of the numbers and actually gone, you know what? Yeah, they are actually beneficial, and this is probably the way that we should go forward with more areas uh, because only about like eight percent of the ocean is protected to some degree. Um, so we'll, we'll need to like add and amend uh, marine protected areas uh, going forwards. But now we have a, a quantitative study uh, that we can push back on, like the fishing industry, and just go, you know what? Actually, these are beneficial for you. Um, so let's protect and um, and increase the size of these marine protected areas. And um, and yeah, hopefully we'll get some new um, newer, bigger fish species for us to uh, to check out whilst we're underwater. Now that we're getting back into the uh, to the diving season, um, there's actually something from the Sharks Trust um, they're hoping that you can get involved in. Um, it's, uh, it's Citizen Science Month, and they're hoping that you can help the Shark Trust by providing vital data about sharks and rays, both close to home and further afield. Uh, in addition to reporting the sharks and rays that you see on your dives and the egg cases that you find on the beach, the Shark Trust is looking for some specific data from divers who are asked to report any ocean oceanic white tip and basking sharks that they see. They're specifically looking for oceanic white tip shark sightings over the coming weeks and months. So if you are diving anywhere in the world, please report your sightings via the website or the app. Uh, you can search for the Shark Trust, um, just the Shark Trust in the app store um, or on their website. I'll pop links down in the in the description if you want to check it out. Uh, so yeah, if you are likely to be diving in an area where there are oceanic white tips, uh, yeah, it, it just helps them and, uh, and gives them some extra data. Oceanic white tips, um, they're, they're pretty recognizable. They're known for their very, very long dorsal and pectoral fins, and the species was once the most abundant ocean, um, uh, oceanic pelagic species uh, of shark on the planet, uh, but because they're a very inquisitive species, they're quite easy prey for fisheries, and 
that combined with their low reproductive rate uh, means that they're like inevitably at high risk of population de uh, depletion and declines of up to 99% have been reported in certain sea areas uh, so they're listed as critically endangered. So if you're lucky enough to get an image of an oceanic white tip and you record your sighting on the Shark Trust app or the website uh, you can actually win a prize. Uh, all images submitted with sightings um, that also give consent to use um, them in uh, conservation messaging uh, will be in a chance to win an Oceanic White Tip t-shirt and a mug, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the competition is um, running up until the end of Shark Month in July. Uh, so yeah, if you do see any, and especially if you do take any pictures of them, uh, if there are sharks in the water and you've got a camera, most people uh, or most divers try to uh, take as many pictures as possible. Uh, so if you get any good ones, uh, yeah, upload it, and obviously you, you don't mind them um, uh, using it, um, then um, yeah, it's definitely worth um, yeah, worth uploading. And um, basking sharks as well. It's uh, it's basking shark season, and the uh, the shark trust is asking everyone to keep an eye out for uh, for these giant sharks over the uh, the summer months. If you do see any, uh, you can record your sighting as well to the Basking Shark Sightings database. Uh, each year, these giant fish return to British waters to feed on the plankton. Um, they're usually quite elusive. It's quite rare to see them, but if you do, um, then yeah sort of april to october is like your best chance of seeing them um and they they're usually seen like uh, feeding around the surface uh where they look like they're basking in the sun hence the name um but sighting hotspots uh, are typically around like the southwest of england uh, around the isle of man you get some around like the northern coast of ireland and uh, western scotland and um one of the most uh, prolific sightings areas is uh, the Sea of Hebrides in uh, in Scotland, but you, you can see them all around the coast uh, if you're lucky enough. Uh, so um, uh, so yeah, if you do see any, the Shark Trust has a uh, a basking shark project, and um, the the more data is uh, is needed to truly understand like where they are in population numbers and distributions. Uh, so you can record your sightings this summer. Uh, I don't think there's a competition for the uh, for the basking shark one. Uh, but yeah, and I'll be impressed if you see some uh, oceanic white tips um, in in British waters. But yeah, if you see a, a basking shark, then, then, then yeah, definitely let them know. And if you're sticking to dry land uh, this season, you can also take place in the Great Egg Case Hunt uh, to get involved in uh, a big citizen science project that helps the sharks, the rays, and skate conservation. And um, yeah, they, they want any snorkelers and divers to uh, to record their underwater egg case findings. So if you do see any um, shark egg cases, um, then yeah, you can um, do that as well. But on the surface, you can log their location, including like the the depth and the substrate um, and wherever they're laying and. Uh, and you can upload that to the uh, to the app as well. Two Saudi Arabian dive centers are said to have become the state's first paddy adaptive service facilities, promising full accessibility for guests with disabilities and special needs. The centers are run by developer Red Sea Global, or RSG, which is wholly owned by Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, and they feature in what it calls a new regenerative tourism destination along the Red Sea coast. So regenerative tourism refers to visitors volunteering to leave a destination in better condition uh, than which they found it. The PADI rating requires the dive centres to have PADI adaptive technique instructors on their staff and wheelchair access throughout, including for training pools and their diving boats as well. Infrastructure, logistics, communication methods, training protocols and safety measures are, quote, uh, designed to be inclusive and welcoming to all divers, says RSG. Uh, instructors participated in three days of classroom pool and open water training using webbed gloves and blackout masks to simulate diving with limited mobility and sight impairment and learning how to guide divers with such disabilities. They are now qualified to teach the Paddy Adaptive Techniques Diver and Adaptive Support Diver Specialties. So that's pretty cool. Um, I've done some work with some uh, some disabled divers and um, and yeah, those, those gloves are, uh, are pretty cool. It's quite nice to have um, webbed hands um, when you're in the water because yeah, you can really like get a move on. Your hands are usually quite useless underwater, but actually when you're using them for, uh, for propulsion, uh, that they're actually fairly good and it's nice to see that um, that more places are becoming more accessible um, to uh, to the disabled especially for um, for scuba divers because there has been that um, 
there were definitely studies that showed the um, just both mental and physical benefits to um, uh, to a lot of um, people, especially if you're like wheel bit wheelchair bound because. They, they find that so limiting and then as soon as they get out of the wheelchair they're in this weightless environment um, then yeah they, they feel so much more from, like free from their uh, their wheelchair so um, yeah it is nice to see more of these programs opening up. NHS Grampian, one of Scotland's 14 regional health boards, has withdrawn funding from the hyperbaric chamber at diving hotspot Oban in Argyll, which for more than 50 years has treated scuba divers affected by decompression illness across the west coast and the outer isles. The West Scotland Centre for Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine, owned and managed by Tritonia Scientific, was one of only three NHS registered recompression facilities in Scotland. Its website now carries the notice, quote, our recompression chamber is not currently operational, with the closure leaving sick divers with the prospect of having to be flown 180 miles east to Aberdeen, north or, uh, to Orkney, 258 miles, or south to Liverpool, 313 miles for emergency treatment. When the NHS Grampian decided not to renew the current contract, it says it put in place plans to transfer patients to its main centre in Aberdeen, Tritonia Managing Director Dr. Martin Sayer claims that the decision was made without consultation. Quoting, we are concerned that this change in how the service is being delivered will cause unnecessary delays to treatment, especially when there is still a perfectly adequate facility in Oban. Um, we are therefore challenging the decision. Yeah, it, it's like when they close uh, lifeboat um, stations. It's, it's like, why? Um, yeah, granted, these um, you can do it with fewer numbers, but yeah, you're putting people at, at risk, and um, more than 400 people have been treated since the uh, the Scottish Marine Biological Association set up the recompression chamber in the late 1960s, uh, initially to support its own diving operations, but from the early 1970s, uh, also providing emergency cover for decompression incidents in the region. A founding me member of the British Hyperbaric Association, it has been owned by Tritonia since 2018. It's only a, a two meter long two person chamber. Uh, it, it's not huge, but it's, it's bigger than some of the ones that I've been in. Uh, and it was installed at the Dunstaffnage Dun uh, Marine Laboratories in 1998 to provide standard air oxygen recompression treatments. Uh, lost along with its closure is the team of five specialist doctors who have been on call to coordinate hyperbaric treatments. Mary Tetley, the CEO of Diving uh, Governing Body, the uh, the British Sub Aqua Club, says this is disappointing news about an important facility that safeguards the well-being of divers in the Western Scotland area. We will continue to work with Tritonia regarding the appeal process and will advise our members on how best to support them going forwards. With no NHS support for diving-related emergencies on the West Coast, Tritonia says that divers should contact the Coast Guard on 999 or Channel 16 or the on-call hyperbaric consult, uh, consultant on NHS Scotland's national helpline on 0345 408 uh, Yeah, it's just one of those things that now you have to bear that in mind when you're diving in that area. Um, you have to reassess all of your, uh, your risk assessment forms and um, yeah, if something goes wrong, uh, then yeah, you, you probably have to be transported to uh, to Aberdeen. As long as that chamber is free, if not, then you have to go what two hundred and fifty something miles to Orkney uh, or three hundred miles down to uh, to Liverpool. Uh, so, which is yeah, just going to delay your uh, your recompression treatment when there's a perfectly functional um, recompression chamber much much closer. But hey, it's um, it is the way it's going forward with budget cuts and everything. So uh, hopefully the um, uh, the appeal process will um, uh, will be looked at seriously and, uh, and yeah, they'll repeal this decision. And finally, the Kirpi Underwater Archeo Park project, uh, which is Turkey's first attempt to create a submerged museum for divers complete with artifacts dating back 2,400 years, is reported to be set for completion this year. So the Kokoli Museum Directorate has been carrying out what it says have been the first scientific underwater excavation 
Operations and Research at Kirpi in the Black Sea over the past four years. Overseen by the country's Minister of Tourism and Culture, its divers have been uncovering historical artifacts dating back from between the 4th century BC and the 12th century AD. Kirpi, uh, originally called Kalpi, uh, which means like a pot or a jar, it lies on the southern uh, Black Sea coast in Turkey's Kokale uh, province and was a trading post in Roman, Byzantine and Genoese times. Um, timber and coal for Istanbul would have been uh, passing through the port during the Ottoman period and the archaeological work has concentrated on the submerged remains of the harbour breakwater about 80 metres offshore, where items including uh, numerous amphorae uh, fragments lie scattered over a wide, wide area. And many of the discoveries are being preserved in place at the four metre deep site for scuba divers and snorkelers to enjoy uh, once the pilot project gets underway. The museum states that it has been inspired by similar ventures in Italy, Israel and and southern Cyprus and other artifacts have already been recovered for display in the museums uh, likely the uh, the more visually spectacular ones uh, they preserve them and, uh, and take them out of the water but they're leaving a lot of things in the water for us to look at so it's hopefully going to become a, a, a diving destination uh, if you're in the area and um, and yeah you've got some free time and you want to go uh, go dive it and uh, and just see some yeah just underwater uh, like bits and bobs and just just see what it's like to be like underwater archaeologists just looking for things um, I imagine there's going to be quite quite strict guidelines about um, no touching and especially no taking uh, and you you'll probably have to be like inspected on the way out to make sure you haven't got any amphorae tucked in under your wetsuit um, but yeah it is just pretty cool so that it's not just a, 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 a normal dive, just um, just checking out a reef or a or a shipwreck or something. Uh, you're, you're actually going over this area and you're looking for yeah, just fragments of history, basically. Looking over at new diving equipment uh, on scuba.com, they've obviously been um, been working closely with Tusa over the uh, the previous weeks. Uh, we've got a lot of new Tusa equipment dropped. Uh, their new HS boots, which looked pretty shiny and cool with lots of tread on the underneath. Uh, their new Zensi mask with their fabric strap. So that's like a, a frameless single lens mask but it comes fitted with that elastic strap. It has a, a snorkel loop on it, if you still dive with the snorkel, uh, and it's also got that um, like silicone detailing on the inside, so it's a bit more grippy. There's a pro version of the Eno mask. Well, there's, there's a standard and a, and a pro version of the Eno mask, and which is, is similar, but it's more designed for smaller faces, so female divers and, uh, and adolescents. The pro version, has those uh, protected lenses to protect them from uh, from bright sunlight uh, and that as well comes with that fabric strap so it's a bit more comfortable uh, for a twin lens design they got the Intega mask and a few new wetsuits um, which look like they've taken a bit of a, um, a taste of the uh, the Aqualung wetsuits of, uh, of previous years and um, there's like a wetsuit top both men's and women's, just two mil thick, long sleeve, zippered down the, the front. So that would be quite nice for just where you want to take the edge off. Uh, you want a bit more than a rash vest, but you don't want like a full on um, steamer or a uh, shorty. And they've got this cool like detailing patterns uh, down one of the sleeves. Um, trousers as well, which are quite cool. And yeah, yeah shorties, uh, everything that you expect. And a kid shorty as well. Um, so something to keep the little ones uh, a little bit warmer in the water. And some sport uh, snorkeling sets and marking snorkel fits. They're always popular around the, uh, the summertime, just um, when people are going away. Uh, so yeah, head over to, uh, to scuba.com. Uh, otherwise, I don't remember seeing a great deal of new, um, new things. We, we, of course, we had April 1st. So there are a handful of um, April Fool's attempts by, um, by some of the dive industry. There wasn't a great deal. The only ones that I remember were um, uh, Paddy, and I think it was Tusa as well. Um, they um, uh, they introduced their uh, their new masks with built-in uh, AI, so it would identify fish uh, as you look at them underwater, which, yeah, would be pretty cool. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but maybe one day uh, we'll probably get there. There was a cool one from, oh, who was it? Was it Ocean Reef um, with one of their uh, their full face masks? And uh, it, it was a clever 
it was a clever picture because the sunlight reflecting off of the lens um, kind of made it look like it was casting light. Uh, and they said that, yeah, we now have our uh, light emitting mask, which was pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that was Photoshop or, uh, or whether it was just natural uh, light done in camera, uh, but hey, that, that was pretty cool. Otherwise that was about it. Um, I don't think, don't think we had any of our hoseless uh, regulators. I think uh, the manufacturers have done that to death. Um, you usually see someone underwater and they just got a second stage in their mouth and they're saying it's, it's hoseless air. Um, didn't see any of those this year, I don't think. Um, but yeah, with the, we, we need to up our game as far as um, April Fool's goes. But uh, yeah, may, maybe next year. So on to some Ask Milk questions. Uh, this one comes from Ernie Bennett, 1774. Uh, but, but I'm still uh, newer to diving and predominantly dive in cold waters. I'm starting the journey of buying my own gear and transitioning to a twin set. I uh, would like to know your uh, observations on the difference between the MTX, uh, sorry, the Apex MTXR and the MTXRC. Is there a measurable benefit for uh, the more expensive RC? Um, the main difference is the uh, the breathing adjustment knob on the side uh with the mtxr it's like the um uh, the recreational version of the military regulator uh, but they still made it um it had like the the nedu which is the oh it's true naval something something unit uh, experimental diving unit or something um they they required it to have fewer fiddly bits um, and they required it to work in like Arctic conditions. So it was made to breathe quite stiff. So your worker breathing was quite high to be able to inhale. You had to, I mean, you could dive it. It wasn't like sucking a hose um, and trying to draw breath from it. Um, but one of the main complaints that um, that recreational divers had for it was that, yeah, actually it, it was quite a hard breathe. Um, which meant that it worked better in colder waters because it was less likely to, uh, to free flow and freeze up. So that's why Apex developed the MTX RC that you could adjust. Personally, not a huge issue for me. I'd be quite happy um, going with the uh, with the standard MT, uh, MTX R. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the white body just because I don't like too much white gear because it doesn't stay white uh, i do prefer like the gunmetal gray of the uh, the rc uh but hey uh is is it worth going for the uh, the rc if if you want a more like standard breathing second stage um then yeah sure but i'd be quite happy with the uh, the standard mtxr um I, I wouldn't worry too much about it i'd be quite happy just just rocking the other uh, standard mtxr um stephen wood 1468 uh is braided hoses or rubber ones better for this or does it matter uh that's on the video why put a transmitter on a short hose um it doesn't really matter um braided hoses high pressure hoses are very very skinny um and if you're doing it on a uh, on a short hose, like a 15 centimeter hose, uh, then yeah, it really doesn't matter that much. Um, if you're, they're both pretty tough. Uh, they both get the job done. Um, the the braided hoses is going to be a little bit lighter uh, and a bit more flexible. Uh, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, Darius uh, Darius Kudera 7293 says. Uh, have you got any information about the Apex RK4? Uh, I'm looking for new fins in the moment. Uh, I need something for heavier configuration, a dry suit twin set and a stage. Uh, and I was just wondering if it's worth waiting for. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're, I haven't used them in the water yet. Um, full disclosure. Uh, I, I have played about with a set and um but never actually in the water yet uh yeah they're, they're a good pair of fin i wouldn't be hanging up my uh, my rk3 fins to uh, to go with this if you already have like a decent pair of like vented fins then i don't think there's going to be that much marketable um like upgrade to it uh the main differences are that spring heel strap is uh, is adjustable now on the rk3 fins it was just a fixed position so if it was a the spring heel was a bit loose or a bit too tight for you. Uh, you just kind of had to get on with it. Whereas now you can adjust it a little bit uh, to make it a bit tighter or a bit looser, depending on the size of, uh, of boots. So that's quite a nice feature. The As far as like 
weight and buoyancy i think they've tried to make it like in between the um the regular and the hd version of the rk3 so it kind of sits in that middle ground they've softened the tip to to give you a bit more precision control for like the fine tuning when you're moving around um but for like just like general propulsion and how they feel i don't think they're going to be that much improved over the year the rk3 fins um is it worth waiting i have seen some or at least one uh, unconfirmed uh, report that the uh, the larger size the super is uh, isn't going to be available until next year uh, so if you're over if your shoe size is like over like a uk 10 uh, you may struggle to find a pair that will fit you until next year they look cool um we might see some this season uh, i don't think i've seen a confirmed release date for them probably because um they they want some um uh, they want to make sure they have enough stock to cover all orders so um yeah i i'm not holding my breath for them this season if they do arrive that's amazing uh, if they don't i won't be overly shocked uh it's just whenever they um like release any kind of information of this uh kind of new product to uh, a lot of dive centers even though it's embargoed they of course upload it to their website so that it ranks on uh, on google <coughs> so that it ranks on google um because they were the first to um uh, to upload it and uh, of course the the cat's out of the bag and now they kind of have to do a little bit of something and their marketing team probably pulls their hair out because they had this entire um like release schedule and now it's just all gone to pop uh but no i I wouldn't be holding my breath for them, um, but if it does fit into your uh, your schedule, they, they do look like a, a very sharp pair of fins. And that's it for another week. Um, yeah, all good news, I think it was. Uh, I don't think there was any bad news, which is quite nice to, uh, to see. Um, not that much has happened over here. I've got a few ratio dive computers on the way to, um, to test out and do some unboxing videos for, uh, so that'll be cool quite exciting um otherwise yeah i've just been working on getting over this cold uh, usually colds tend to uh, like go to my chest and end up coughing uh, which is a real pain when i'm trying to like record and talk in front of a camera or a uh, microphone but actually it's uh, it seems to have dissipated relatively quickly uh, which is quite nice um but yeah anyway remember to uh, to head over to our website scubadivingmag.com uh, all links to uh, everything that i've spoken about are going to be down in the description below if you want to check out like the shark trust uh, app and all that good stuff and um yeah remember to like share subscribe do all that good social media stuff uh, thank you for listening everybody and of course safe diving